people want to sit up front or take the chairs in the back and be a kid that sits in the back. Daryl, go ahead and take care of your stuff. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we're, we're going to get started here. Hi, Mark. Hi. How are you? Sure. I'm great. I, 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 I'm so happy everyone is here. Mark, we're, we're about to give you an award. Okay, so just, let's, just, let's just give you an award. Let's just do this. Okay. Mark, Mark Chevalier has been named Law of the Visionary of 2014. Yay! Yay! Do you want to give him the award? You said you were going to give him the award. Okay. You what? said you were going to give him the award. Yeah, Nathan will film it. It'll be fun. Okay, Nathan, you're in charge. Yeah, Nathan's in charge. That means you have to make sure we don't end up out of frame. Come up here. Can you give, give him the award? Okay, so Mark is a really gifted guy. Mark is a very gifted historian. He's a good friend, and he's done a lot of fundamental, deep and fundamental work in topics that you care about, which is the first thing you can do. So, without further ado, because of that, we're going to give you the award of 2014 for Law of the Visionary of the Year, and it is... Do you have it, Kim? What do you need that for? Okay. <laughs> Mark. Of course, you do a great deal of work with a, a Mormon gentleman who went astray. <laughs> yes. And we know that he was always with Mr. Aviat, Aviat, however you like to say it. He was always feeling the pressure from Salt Lake. And we want you to feel that pressure too as you do your work. So if you'll please remove the covering. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Smith is a bookend. <laughs> Founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the Mormons, and uh, yeah, James Oviatt was a raised Mormon to his eternal uh, disgust. But, <laughs> <laughs> go put that down. Okay, good. Go put that down. We're gonna get started. Maybe I could just do the whole lecture. Like yeah, you're, you're yeah. Put it down. Okay, so Mark, thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Mark for being here. Started. I just quickly, several people asked me about the history of this place. I, I'm sorry, I usually say a little something. We are in the old Shaver's Cafeteria. Uh, Charles Plummer is the architect, 1928. Uh, they used to have some really great tile. There is still extant tile in the basement. Um, when Jonathan comes back from his holiday, maybe next time we'll get a little tour, but it's really beautiful tile. So this is uh, this was a cafeteria. Uh, we had Pepper Arfald, our friend, talk about two months ago, and she remembers coming here. So this is just, this is, this is a great cafeteria. Does that answer your question? About the place? Good. All right, Mark, let's get started. James Bovia, okay. and I'll, I'll do the slides for you. Thank you. by people whom you respect and love, uh, and who richly deserve the award themselves. Uh, which is like, I would like to award Kim and Richard. Huh. Just kidding. No, but they deserve it, seriously. And I guess they are awarded every time we come that's right. uh, to their events. That, that is a, that's an award in of itself. Um, oh, I'm going to need my glasses. Let's have a little more light, Richard. It's quite all right. A little more light? A little more light.
I began to share this story because a talented filmmaker or maker named Seth Schulman convinced me that we could make a documentary out of it. And the Art Deco Society of Los Angeles and the American Cinematheque helped Seth and me to screen it. I've continued to share because Richard Shade and Kim Cooper have enthusiastically opened new avenues for me to do so again and again. So those bones are not there at all. We're in this together. Next. Well, are you ready for a uh, Los Angeles story? Yeah. All right, this one is both brilliant and it's dark. It's about a man who in the early to mid 20th century was at the nexus of a growing Los Angeles and its most powerful movers and shakers. People who came here from somewhere else refashioned themselves and then sought to refashion Los Angeles as they saw fit, regardless of cost. Among them was this man, James Oviatt, a nobody who arrived from nowhere and opened a haberdashery and men's clothing store, the finest and most expensive on the West Coast, if not the nation. The store's motto was service, but James Oviatt did not want to serve. His ambition was to rise along with his powerful customers and be their equal. In the 1920s, he achieved that goal and became a celebrity in his own right, a men's fashion superstar decades before Ralph Lauren and Giorgio Armani. But Oviatt, like some of the leaders he clothed and socialized with, had a dark side, an anti-Semitism so virulent that it grew to engulf him, leading him down to the shadowy world of right-wing paramilitary groups and guerrilla warfare camps. Really? <laughs> Plots to overthrow the United States government and acts that would destroy his family ties and the business he built. It's no wonder that Raymond Chandler inserted James Oviatt, slightly fictionalized, in a Sam Spade novel. The Haberdasher's rise and fall was a noir story in itself. Good question. Is the, is the microphone too strong? I feel like I'm... Okay. Farmington, Utah. James Ozera Oviet was born in Farmington in 1888. Farmington was, as the name suggests, a town of farmers. But that communal agrarian life was changing during Oviet's childhood. He was the grandson of a Mormon pioneer and the son of the town's blacksmith. In earlier years, Oviet's father, due to his trade, had held a prominent place in Farmington. In Farmington but that town began to grow and become more industrialized, and blacksmithing became less and less important. Retailers and investors were the new elites, and young James Oviatt chose to work in his eldest brother's dry goods store, rather than father following his father's footsteps. Little James was the family's black sheep. He rebelled against their devout Mormonism and began to smoke and drink before his teens. At 16, he ran away from Farmington to Salt Lake City, where he worked as a sales clerk and window dresser at several department stores, took business courses at the YMCA, and joined as many social clubs as possible. Next. In 1909, Oviatt joined the Elks Club and went with them to a regional conference in Los Angeles. There, the visiting Elks were given a grand tour of Southern California, the mountains, the beaches, the balloon route, the ostrich farm. Oviatt was entranced by what he saw. A week later, when the Elks boarded their train for Salt Lake City, James Oviatt did not join them. He stayed in Los Angeles. With little money, no job, no connections, and no prospects, Oviatt began to pound the streets of downtown LA. And in 1909, downtown was growing at a rapid pace. It wasn't hard for Oviatt to find a window dressing job at the prestigious Desmond's department store where he quickly rose to a management position. Next. Oviatt realized that in Los Angeles, there were no elites who could permanently bar him entrance. There was no rock-solid social barrier that he could not break through. Nearly everyone here had come from somewhere else. The most ambitious were on the rise, and Oviatt could rise with them. Enter Frank Baird Alexander, a hat salesman at 
the Desmond store. There he is on the left. Frank Alexander had the good fortune to marry a baking company heiress. And as her spouse, he had won memberships in the Los Angeles' finest golf and country clubs. Oviatt and Alexander became friends. Alexander taught Oviatt how to golf. And then one day, in 1911 or 1912, the two men decided to open their own clothing store. Oviatt had no startup money, and Alexander's in-laws declined to help, but a financial angel did appear as a silent partner. Add Frank Shaver Allen, on the right, a very wealthy architect who had lost his profession in the aftermath of a sex scandal. Some evidence suggests that Allen was infatuated with Oviatt and that their partnership was more than strictly monetary. Next. <laughs> the Alexander and Oviatt haberdashery opened in July 1912. It was a hole in the wall inside a crumbling little building on East 4th Street. Alexander and Oviatt knew what they were doing, though. Shabby though it was, their store's building was right in the heart of LA's booming banking district right across the street from the prestigious Angeles Hotel. Resident and visiting bankers, attorneys, and stockbrokers would walk by the haberdashery every day, and Alexander Noviet would reel them in. The key was in the inventory. Every day, uh, from day one, the haberdashery sold only the finest products, most of them imported from England and France. Frank Alexander made customers out of his golf and country club contacts, and James Oviet through Alexander's sponsorship, not only joined the Los Angeles Athletic Club, but moved into a room in the club's new building in order to have daily access to affluent potential customers. From the beginning, the little shop was a success, earning astonishing profits every single year, so much so that by 1923, the store's income was 12 times greater than it had been in 1912. With success came the need to change locations. Only three years after opening, the Alexander Noviet store moved into the large and opulent consolidated realty building on 6th and Hill Street. With its wealth of new potential customers, real estate brokers, and oil company executives. Alexander Noviet also captured the fancy of the new movie industry and its biggest producers and stars. For decades afterward, the shop would be known as Hollywood's haberdashers. Four years passed, and the store expanded. Its street-level frontage was spanned to 60 feet. Alexander Noviet hired designer Joseph Thiel to drench the shop's interior in 17th century English Jacobean style. Lots of burnished oak, Moroccan leather, and oriental carpets. Meanwhile, the partnership between Oviet and Alexander was beginning to fray. James Oviatt had just returned from a year of stateside naval service in the First World War, where he had quickly risen in rank. Oviatt came back with a new taste for hierarchy. He declared himself <laughs> store president, <laughs> and somehow pressed Alexander into becoming its secretary treasurer. Next. <coughs> it was now the summer of 1920. Post-war year was cheap. Oviatt decided to go there, and he went in style. Went, and he boarded the Olympic, the Titanic sister ship, bought a car, and drove all over the back roads of England, Scotland, Ireland, France, Italy, Switzerland, and Belgium, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, searching for the best weavers, crofters, embroiderers, bead workers, dyers, leather workers, commissioning exclusive creations from them to be picked up by him the following summer. In his few moments of spare time, Oviatt flew in a biplane over battlefield sites, attended England's Royal Ascot races, golfed at St. Andrews in Scotland, stayed at the, kind, the continent's finest hotels, and found time to gamble in Monte Carlo. And after returning to Los Angeles, he called a press conference to tell the newsmen all about it. <laughs> this was the first of many summer buying trips Oviatt would take, and always on such legendary ocean liners as the majestic Bremen, the Normandy, the Queen Mary, and the Queen Elizabeth. Next. One year later, in September 1921, Frank Alexander cut himself while shaving. The cut led to an undiagnosed blood poisoning, and Alexander died. His widow, Hattie, inherited 
his widow Hattie inherited a majority share of the Shore store's stocks and a powerful voting presence on its board of directors. But because Hattie was a spendthrift who did not know how to manage her finances, James Oviatt offered to oversee her money and provide her with an allowance in exchange for giving him complete control of the business. Hattie agreed to the deal, and Oviatt became his store's sole master. Next. Skip. 1923, the decade was beginning to roar, and James Oviatt, already wealthy beyond his dreams, had decided to build his very own skyscraper. The location he chose was a parcel of land near the corner of 6th and Olive Street. That future skyscraper would prove to be Oviatt's greatest monument and joy, but also his life's Achilles heel. The land was owned by Margaret Coleman, a devoutly Catholic woman who offered Oviatt a long-term renewable lease rather than sell him the tract. Oviatt agreed to her terms, but that agreement would prove to be the greatest mistake of his life. The building would be 12 stories high, the city's legal height limit, most of it to be rented out as expensive offices. The powerhouse firm of Walker and Eisen would be the architects. In step with downtown fashion, the building's facade would be Florentine Renaissance in design. The Alexander Noviet store would occupy the first three floors, and a penthouse for James Oviet, the second penthouse in Los Angeles, would sit atop the roof. Not surprisingly, the skyscraper would be named the James Oviet Building. Next. And the 1920s roared on and on. James Oviet became one of the city's most expensive amateur golfers, a card-carrying member of the Annandale, Lakeside, Hillcrest, and Riviera Country Clubs. Oviet was a regular at dozens of amateur and champion tournaments as a player and spectator. In 1927, he famously paid $4,000 in cash for the privilege of owning golf champion George Von Elm in a single tournament. George played regularly with Von Elm, Walter Hagen, Leo Deagle, and even the legendary Bobby Jones. One practical joke that Oviet inflicted on Jones was so outrageous, it earned a full article in the New York Times. Meanwhile, Oviatt kept the rest of his wealthy and powerful customer friends boozed up. In 1923, the LA Athletic Club's kitchen storerooms were raided by the LAPD's vice squad. Scores of liquor balls and cases belonging to club members were found and seized. Included in the $100,000 hoard were dozens of cases marked James Oviatt. But their owner wasn't busted. Oviatt escaped prosecution and kept his stash by showing that it had been purchased prior to Prohibition and had already been declared. The amount of booze was enough to keep his parties liquored up for the next 10 years. <laughs> the decades roar grew louder. Under Oviatt's helm, the company's profits rose at a dizzying pace, and the blacksmith's son, the former window dresser, was now a Los Angeles titan in his own right. He began to invest heavily in local oil ventures and silver mining near Death Valley. He joined his future's building's architects, Albert Walker and Percy Eisen, in financing numerous property development schemes, a neighborhood for millionaires in Pasadena, the new Beverly Crest section of Upper Beverly Hills, and the grandest of all, a gargantuan beach club hotel and golf course to be called the Royal Palms on the cliffs near the Palace Verdes. The Royal Palms was to have a clubhouse more than two blocks long, with a 1,000-person dining room and two Olympic-sized indoor pools, a 350-acre private park, two 18-hole golf courses, dozens of tennis, squash, and handball courts, and a mile-long seaside promenade. How, however, it failed. It failed because of the Great Depression. Next. It's May 1927, four and a half years after James Oviatt had signed his long-term lease on the Coleman Tract, he'd finally raised enough capital to begin construction on the Oviatt building. Walker and Eisen, the architects, now favored Italian Romanesque design elements rather than Italian Renaissance. Terracotta had become the preferred material for the building's facade. Oviatt agreed to the design changes and asked that a tower be added. The tower would be above three elevator shafts and would hold the elevator's motors. You can clearly see the penthouse on the, in this picture at the top. 
Notice that the store's front entrance and bottom had a striped canvas awning. That element would not last long. To design the store's interior and the interior of the penthouse, Oviatt hired Feel and Paradise, who had also designed the store in Sixth and Hill. That store's oak paneling, display cases, furniture, and grand staircase were to be moved and installed inside the new building. But James Oviatt would need more managers for the store and the building. And so he contacted four of his Utah nephews, who were all in college at the time, and offered them an all-expenses-paid vacation to Los Angeles. Oviatt wined and dined them here, gave them tours of the Hollywood studios, and offered a deal. Quit college, join the company as managers, and eventually inherit shares of the business. All four nephews said yes. Oviatt's favorite, Lewis, was to be the new building's manager and it was a hiring decision that would bear bitter fruit and disastrous consequences. Next. Oviatt then went off on his annual summertime buying trip, but in addition to shopping for clothes and fabrics, he was looking to furnish his building in the penthouse. He quickly found a one-stop location for a shopping spree, a department store in Paris named the Galerie Lafayette. This enormous store had its own prestigious, very modernistic design studio, La Maitrice, headed by Maurice Dufresne, its artistic director, a man who passionately supported a new style called Art Moderne, what we now call French Art Deco. La Maitrice offered the latest deco furniture, fabrics, metalwork, potteries, rugs, and cabinetry, and Oviat bought scores of everything. Now, just a year earlier, Maurice Dufresne had commissioned a new cornice and arcade ceiling for the Galerie's Lafayette Old Beaux-Arts frontage. This new frontage would be all glass and lighted from within. The style was perfectly art modern. Engineer Ferdinand Chanu and glass designer Gatin Janin made the designs. Revolving color wheels in yellow, red, and green, and blue swirled around the interior of the glass. Oviet saw the new ceiling and flipped out. He cabled his own store designer, Joseph Thiel, and said, come to France at once. We have to redesign my building. And so Joseph Thiel sailed on July 27, got to Paris. Oviet said, you, you must remake my store into Art Modern. And Joseph Thiel said, what is Art Modern? He'd never heard of it. He said, Mr. Oviet, I'm going to have to teach myself what art modern is. Give me a lot of money. I will buy <laughs> art books at the finest bookstores in Paris, and I will learn. And Oviet gave him the money. Thiel educated himself, and sure enough, he sailed back to the US and started, brought French Art Deco to a Los Angeles building. In the end, over 100 tons of furnishings were exported from France to Los Angeles in order to furnish the Oviatt building. It was the largest shipment of decorative furnishings that ever had ever gone through the Panama Canal. Next. Maurice Dufresne, in addition to heading the La Maîtrise uh, at the uh, department store, was also head of the Salon des Artistes Décorateurs, a prestigious interior design exhibition held every summer in Paris. Dufresne brought Oviat to the Salon and introduced him to, to its most famous exhibitor, René Lalique, the master glassmaker. Oviat contracted Lalique to design and manufacture door and elevator panels for his new building, three massive chandeliers, and a large multi-paneled wall clock. It was the first commercial American, pro American project that Lalique had ever consented to. Before being shipped to the U.S. in 1928, a pair of glass doors and one of the giant chandeliers were exhibited at the prestigious Salon de Autant design show in the Grand Palais of Paris. Lalique and Oviet worked together to design a logo for the future building. Two angels, representing Los Angeles, the city of the angels, holding a mission bell representing Los Angeles' old world Mexican heritage. 
The new logo would be showcased on two massive glass doors that would open into the Alexander Oviet store. And you see in the center one of those two panels, that, black, that is one glass panel. It weighed several tons. It was seven and a half feet tall. Where, the, is, it, where is it now? It is now a, in a crate in the basement of the uh, University of Utah Museum of Fine Arts, and it cannot be seen. Why? Um, a long story I'll try to get to. <laughs> Next. At the salon, James Oviet was introduced to Sadie et Fils. They were cabinet makers and furniture makers, and they were pioneers in Art Deco. Oviet saw a living room set and a bar set at the salon and commissioned copies for his own penthouse. Every stick of furniture that James Oviet ended up importing for his penthouse was in fact designed and made by Sadier Hafiz. Next. Well, James Oviet made one more purchase before leaving Paris. He bought a brand new, dark brown, absolutely gargantuan Hispano Suiza H6B town car <laughs> with custom coachwork by Hibbert and Darren. The cost was $24,000. A staggering sum in 1927. Oviet and Joseph Thiel actually drove this behemoth all over Paris and then shipped it off to the US. When the Depression hit and Oviet was strapped for cash, he began to rent out his Hispanoisen to the movie studios. A number of early 1930s films and beyond uh, showcased it Arsene Lupin, Barclay Square most famously, Grand Hotel, 1930s Oscar winner for Best Picture. Greta Garbo's limousine, that's her car. In fact, Catherine Hepburn, when she first arrived in Hollywood in 1932, rented out the limousine for herself and had herself driven around town thinking she would make a splash. The thing is that everyone in Hollywood knew that it was a rental car because they'd seen it in a million films. <laughs> she ended up being laughed. <laughs> Uh, next, please. And so here's the building under construction. At the bottom, if you notice at the far right photo at bottom, there's no canvas awning. The glass cornice and arcade ceiling that Ferdinand Chanu and Gatin Jeanin uh, were building for Oviet was being installed. Five of Chanu's assistants arrived from Paris to assemble it. The sidewalk in front of the store had rubber tiles. This was a promotional stunt. Uh, Oviet said that people would be so dazzled by his display windows that they would stand in front of it for hours and their feet would get tired, so he put in a rubber sidewalk <laughs> and got a lot of press for it. Yeah, uh, 15 years later, these tiles would be immortalized by Raymond Chandler in his second novel, The Lady in the Lake. Also imported from France was a three-faced neon clock for the tower. You see it at the far right photo. The clock's chime bell mechanism, which was supposed to play traditional songs and patriotic tunes, never worked. A quarter century later, Walt Disney would purchase the chime bells from James Oviatt and install them in his It's a Small World ride at the 1964 New York World's Fair. Next. And there you go. That's what the outdoor lobby of the building looked like in 1928. Twelve tons of roller-glossed, sand-etched, and hand-painted glass panels. The cornice had eight revolving color wheels behind the glass, illuminating it at night in red, green, and blue alternating colors. There were 28 display windows outside, including four octagonal glass pillars. Next. And this is how the store's interior turned out. It turned, Oviat wanted, as it turned out, a pastiche. A bit of Art Deco mixed in with the English Jacobean. And so that's what he got. Oak paneling. Crests of the buildings of the store were everywhere. But if you look closely at this photo, especially in the ceiling area, you will see the elements of Art Deco that uh, Joseph Field popped in. Next. 
And here was some of the stuff that he was selling when the store opened in the new Oviat building. Just to give you an idea, um, that luggage over there was about $1,000 per piece. On the right was a beverage uh, container, as he called it, because you couldn't say booze, it was still prohibition. And that was about $800. At the bottom was a perfume that was sold only at the Oviet store. It had, the bottle had been designed by René Lalique himself. You see the Mission Bell design, and you see the two angels holding the Mission Bell as well. That perfume cost $25 a bottle. Enormous sums back then. Next. And here was James Oviat's penthouse and rooftop. The pen interior of the penthouse is easily the most Art Deco part of the entire building. It has 12 rooms, still exists. Living room walls covered in mauve-colored silk. Lalique chandeliers, sand-edged glass windows, skylights by Gaetan Jeanin. The penthouse rooftop was very similar to the LA Athletic Clubs. It had a large canvas sunshade canopy, like the clubs, a tennis court, like the clubs, and a sunbathing area, like the clubs. The penthouse also had a massage and steam room, also like the Alice in his athletic club. It had a deep walled fountain, which was later called a swimming pool, sort of erroneously. Next. And there you go, look at me at the top left. You, you know you reached fame when you're in a nationally syndicated comic strip. <laughs> Some of Oviat's Hollywood friends are here. You can see in the bottom left, uh, Maurice Chevalier with James Oviat at a notorious gay club of the time, actually, the Club New Yorker, which was on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, on the top right, there's James Oviet at the races with W.C. Fields. On the bottom right, James Oviet um, wearing the green suit being satirized of the guy who could sell you anything. It says, I only wanted a hat, but Mr. Jinx, you could be a model for a fashion plate this very minute. <laughs> Next. Well, here's a problem. You open your store in May 1928, and then a year and a half later, the stock market crashes. The Great Depression almost immediately hit the menswear industry, and Oviat started to fail. He had a lot of deadbeat credit customers. He began to blame his failure on a specific group, the Jews. Why? I don't think it was because of his Mormon upbringing, not at all. I think it was because when he would visit Europe in the 20s and he would talk with his suppliers, especially in Germany and Austria and in France, they would tell him about how a Jewish conspiracy of bankers, financiers, industrialists were strangling their businesses or causing inflation problems everywhere. At the same time, they would talk of Jewish Marxists who wanted to overthrow the great capitalist world order. Oviat heard their words and he believed them. And when he himself started to run into trouble, he seemed to see Jews behind every, every uh, rejection and every, uh, every problem. Oviat was in big, big trouble. He started to hold sales for the first time, lots and lots of them. He went after his deadbeat customers. Nothing, nothing was working. It looked like he was going to have to close only a couple of years after his building had been, had been created. But then, at the final hour, there was a salvation. In 1932, in a sweetheart deal, Oviat was able to essentially pawn the building to Bank of America which agreed to hold it for him for 10 years. At the end of that period, he had the option to buy it back at the pawn price, with minimal interest. The store could stay in the building, and Oviet in his penthouse. Now this deal sounds too good to be true, along with Oviet's employment of his nephew, Louis, would end up having terrible consequences, but not yet. So the store was saved, and the building was saved. Oviet had a second win. He had not fired a single salesperson, even in the times of trouble, and immediately after the Bank of America deal, he gave them all raises. He opened a third floor custom tailoring workroom, 
employed over 80 full-time tailors, and he started investing again. He was a founding partner in the Santa Anita racetrack. He, uh, with the Hollywood crowds, he'd spend weekends in Palm Springs, Sun Valley, and hunted in Mexico. Next. In 1933, just the same year he was saved, he opened a 25-year lease on the northeast corner of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And there was the branch store, Oviet's Beverly Wilshire. He also opened an importing company, brought in European booze. Why? Repeal. This was a perfect time. William Powell was a big customer. He ordered case after case after case of the stuff. That's Harlow squeeze. Yes, right. That's right. Oviet also opened a bar on the second floor of his store. The specialty was the Singapore Slings. Next. And here are some of the stars that wore Oviet clothing. In fact, that photo on the top left shows Humphrey Bogart wearing an Oviet suit. His Oviet suits had a certain distinction. They would have the boutonniere hole on the right lapel instead of on the left. Made them identifiable. Bottom right, there's Adolf Monjou wearing an Oviet hat. Bottom left, there's Walt Disney wearing an Oviet sports shirt. And top right, there's Howard Hughes wearing an Oviet tie. So Greta Garbo bought her berets there. Mylene Dietrich shopped at Oviets for her top hats. Carol Lombard bought gifts at the Beverly Hills Oviet store for William Powell and then Clark Gable. A uh, funny little story about Howard Hughes and Oviet. Howard Hughes was a friend and customer who stopped being both after an infamous Oviet prank. Hughes, who owed James Oviet money on a golf bet, was about to embark on his round the globe flight in 1935 when Oviet got hold of the aviator's super secret itinerary. He ended up selling, sending telegrams at each one of Howard Hughes's secret stops. When Howard Hughes would arrive, the telegram would be handed to him saying, you're still alive? I can't believe it. Well, I think it's time for you to pay off my bet before, uh, before you get killed at the next one. <laughs> After a few stops of this, uh, Oviet received a telephone call from uh, Hughes' secretary saying that Mr. Hughes was going to immediately pay off the bet and never wanted to speak with Oviet again. <laughs> and that's how it happened. And then finally, in 1939, Clark Gable had Oviet's Beverly Hills make a number of costumes for him to wear as Fred Butler in Gone with the Wind. Next. Ah, and look who's there, Raymond Chandler. World War II began. Oviet cut off his buying trips to Europe and stopped importing. Government restrictions took their toll and the store's profits began to decline. To compensate and protect his highly skilled employees from being drafted, Oviet's business began making custom military uniforms and was thus designated an essential industry to the war effort. <laughs> Oviet's new customers included colonels and generals, several of whom would induct the haberdasher into a secret ring of anti-Semitic, anti-communist paramilitary groups after the war. So I'm going to quote real quickly from uh, Raymond Chandler's novel, The Lady in the Lake, uh, which, the very first page of which, uh, depicts the fictionalized Oviet building. The trailer building was and is on Olive Street near 6th on the west side. The sidewalk in front of it had been built of black and white rubber blocks. They were taking them up now to give to the government, and a hatless, pale man with a face like a building superintendent was watching the work and looking as if it was breaking his heart. The Gillerland Company was in front. Oviet's company, basically swinging the double-plate glass doors bound in platinum. The reception room had Chinese rugs, dull silver walls, angular but elaborate furniture, sharp, shiny bits of abstract cult sculpture on pedestals. Uh, Chandler also described Oviet in the form of Darius Kingsley. I don't think I have a lot of time to describe that, but he has Kingsley say, I'm a businessman, I don't fool around. That's exactly something that Oviet would have said. The dark side begins to grow with Oviet. We're going to get into that very soon, but I want you to keep it in mind. Next, please. Up until now, Oviet had remained a bachelor. 
but that was going to change because he was aging. Enter Mary Richards. She was from New Mexico, and in the early 40s, Mary Richard worked as a sales clerk and outfit model at Oviets. She was 18, he was 53, <laughs> robbing the cradle, as he used to say. He was attracted to her, they started a real secret relationship. And in 1945, he proposed to her. She had finally become, I think, 20, 21. They were married in Reno. So yet they, um, they moved, or they spent a lot of time at a ranch near Temecula that Oviedo had bought a few years earlier. He raised cattle, hogs, and turkeys. Not coincidentally, the land around the ranch looked like Farmington, Utah. And also not coincidentally, the Farmington elites of Oviedo's youth had owned cattle ranches. Uh, Mary Richards was friends with the young Marilyn Monroe. They had been models together, and Mary invited her up to the ranch in the late 40s. They went dancing in the local community hall where the cowboys were. And this is before Monroe was famous. But I'll tell you this, the, cow the cowboys who are still alive today, every one of them remember that night when they danced with a young Marilyn Monroe. They had a loving relationship, uh, Mary and James. She called him Papa, and he called her Boss. They had one son, one child, James Oviedo Jr., known to Jimmy, born in 1955. And Jimmy had a difficult relationship with his father, who was 67 years his senior. A shy and lonely boy, little Jimmy spent his early childhood playing in the store until his father shunted him off to military school. Next. And now the darkness really begins. Unfortunately for the company, a new dark generation of Hollywood actors and others were turning towards new clothing stores in Beverly Hills and Palm Springs. James Oviatt had to reach out beyond Southern California to attract new clients. He focused his sights on Texas and its oil men and did so successfully. Lyndon B. Johnson became a customer. International customers continued to come. The Shah of Iran, the President of Mexico, among many others. Eisenhower, Johnson, Ford, and Reagan. Eisenhower bought a Vicuña overcoat at Oviatt's. In 1952, after having returned from his first European buying trip during the World War II, he called a press conference, Oviatt, to express his admiration for Spain's dictator, Generalissimo Francisco Franco. Oviatt told the newspapers, Franco has rid Spain of bureaucrats, has created employment to rebuild Spain from its revolutionary ruins. The people love him. Madrid is a clean and well-groomed city. Coats are mandatory on the streets and in public <laughs> gatherings. A cab driver was arrested and fined for not wearing his cap. The streets are washed with fire hoses three times a day." End quote. It was his idea of heaven. Meanwhile, Oviet's relationship with his four nephews, the managers, had long since soured. They were grateful that he kept them employed throughout the Depression, but came to realize that he never intended to give them shares in the business. Oviet pitted the nephews against each other so that they wouldn't ally against him. He constantly promoted and demoted them using the carrot and stick approach. The nephews were not allowed to move up, only sideways. One of them, Lewis, the building manager, had had enough. When Oviet bought back the building from Bank of America in 1943, he had Lewis, his nephew, give them the check in Lewis's name. The building's shares were now in Lewis's name too, all to avoid taxes. Seven years later, Oviatt asked Lewis to hand him over the shares, and the nephew refused. He demanded that Oviatt buy the shares, and therefore the building instead. It was then that James Oviatt decided to kill his nephew. <laughs> Oviatt had a chauffeur, and he had the chauffeur secretly sabotage Lewis's car. I think it was the brakes. Lewis narrowly avoided an accident, and he figured out that something had been done. A few months later, Lewis Oviatt needed to have an operation, a surgery, for varicose veins in his legs. Oviet had his chauffeur contact the surgeon and try to bribe him to let Lewis die on the operating table. The surgeon refused and told
told the story to Lewis, who kept quiet. Finally, James Oviet gave up trying to kill his nephew and started a lawsuit against him. But before it came to trial, Lewis confronted his uncle and said that he knew about the murder attempts. Oviat called the lawsuit off and ended up paying Lewis for the shares. The nephew, now wealthy, left Los Angeles for good and never looked back. Moving a little bit into the early 60s, I had mentioned that James Oviet had made some military friends who were, after the war, began to form paramilitary organizations. Oviet became very involved with groups called the Christian Nationalist Crusade, the California Rangers, the Minutemen, and the Christian Defense League. He was also one of the first members of the John Birch Society and was a personal friend of its founder, Robert Welch. He began to print on his letterheads and on his envelopes for the store, this is a republic, not a democracy. Let's keep it that way. <laughs> Throughout the early 1960s, the LA Times printed nearly a dozen editorial letters from James Oviatt expressing his strong anti-Semitic and anti-communist views. Some of the letters' titles were, Enough of Anti-Anti-Reds, Goodbye America, and Apathetic People Should Learn to Count in Rubles. <laughs> Other newspapers, both local and national, received a stream of letters from Oviet urging a stiffening of our national backbone against Chief Justice Earl Warren, the United Nations, and the invisible government of the new frontier. In 1962, Oviet began to mail anti-Semitic flyers and booklets in store envelopes to, to his charge customers, a mailing list with 3,000 names. Los Angeles was leaving behind its anti-Semitic past. It was no longer acceptable, let alone publicly so, to be anti-Semitic. Reacting to complaints about James Oviatt's anti-Semitic flyers, the director of the Anti-Defamation League went and visited him. Oviatt said he was not responsible for the flyers, and no one in his employ had made such literatures. However, the Beverly Hills Times newspaper got hold of the flyer and printed it. The flyer said, wake up, buy your Christian gifts from Christians. <laughs> <laughs> the newspaper confronted Oviet, who said, I see nothing wrong in opposing a certain group if its members are trying to keep the rest of us from enjoying Christmas carols and Christmas trees and that sort of thing. But I'm not admitting anything. <laughs> One year later, Oviet printed and sold at his store a booklet of excerpts from the International Jew which had been printed by Henry Ford's independent newspaper in the 1920s. He sent a copy inspired, inscribed compliment of James Oviatt to the mayor of Los Angeles, Sam Yorty, who had actually been an Oviatt salesperson for decades earlier. The store's windows now displayed poster-sized advertisements by the John Birch Society. Complaints increased about Oviatt's pamphlets, which he continued to mail out, sell, and distribute. Oviet was asked by the newspapers to confess the error in bearing false witness against your neighbors and fellow men. Oviet responded by saying that what he mailed was his own business. <laughs> Within weeks, a substantial number of the store's customers canceled their credit accounts and boycotted shopping there. Well, Oviet sort of ignored it, and he moved on to something a little bit deeper, those paramilitary groups. In 1963, one of the paramilitary groups, the Minutemen, held region-wide field training exercises at Oviatt's ranch. Attended by 50 members, they practiced making and using explosives, incendiary weapons, booby traps, Molotov cocktails, anti-vehicular mines, railroad mines, rocket launchers, grenades, mortar weapons, and more. These men arrived at Oviatt's ranch at night, all of them wearing masks. They called each other by numbers, not by names. In 1964, responding to accusations against him and to declining sales at his stores, James Oviatt launched a $20 million lawsuit against the uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League of Nyberth and local newspapers. 
you can see on the right side a booklet that he printed where he described why he was launching the lawsuit. He ended up being kicked out from the John Birch Society because he was too anti-Semitic for them. <laughs> he responded by giving the third floor of his building over to a group called the Christian Defense League, which was a front for the Minutemen. And finishing up here, go next one please if you would. Well, that was pretty much the end of it. That was the end. Oviad's sales declined to such a point that he could no longer keep his store open. He had already closed the Beverly Hills store a few years earlier, and the Los Angeles store could not keep up. In 1966, oh, and he canceled the lawsuit, by the way. In 1966, Oviad sold his ranches, and he closed the store. Not only did he close the store, but he had dismantled the beautiful glass ceiling that was in the front. He ended up selling the glass for $50 to a young photographer in exchange for the photographer coming with his friends, taking all the glass out and hauling it away. Luckily, half of that glass ceiling still exists. It's now in storage at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and I'm told it will be put back together within the next five years or so. And so, what can I tell you? This was the end of Oviet. When he died, just a few years later, uh, could you change it? This is the last one. He died just a few years later in 1974. He was sleeping in his penthouse at this point, almost completely senile, and was woken up by the aftershock of an earthquake Getting out of bed in fear, he tripped and fell and ended up in the hospital and died. He was 88 years old, no, I'm sorry, 86 years old, had no funeral and had no grave, uh, grave. His ashes were scattered in Santa Monica Bay. The truth is that the building itself was his monument. And the greatest tragedy of all, the building, I told you that he did not own the land. The woman who owned the land, Margaret Coleman, when she died, left it to the Roman Catholic Archdiocese, who hated James Ophia. <laughs> and before he died, they did everything they could to prevent him from selling the building, which he was then trying to do. After he died, his wife Mary contracted cancer. She died the following year. They were up to their ceiling in debts, and the trust for the Oviet family gave the building to the Catholic Archdiocese in return for releasing them of the debts. The Archdiocese immediately tried to sell the building as a teardown. Yeah. They advertised it as the perfect place to build a parking structure. Well, luckily, it was not torn down. That's a long story in itself. Uh, but. Uh, Oh, and then Jimmy, the last of all, little Jimmy Oviat, the son. He ended up becoming an alcoholic and drug addict. Never worked a day in his life, until the very end, actually. And he died of cancer at the age of 36. He left no heirs, and that was the end of James Oviat's family. So there you go, the rise and fall of a, a titan, a guy with a lot of flaws but maybe reflected the flaws of some of the people around him as well, some of the leaders of Los Angeles. That's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. That means that he was only four. Oh no, 
No. So how old was he when he came to Los Angeles then? I've got a uh, he was 21. Okay, thank you. You bet. Go ahead. Questions? Yes. Yes, Gene. Uh, Gene's body. Hi, Gene. Hi. You mentioned that the giant golf resort he's going to build in Palos Verdes, which was sort of killed by the depression. Did they start to build it or just they lose the financing and never built it? No, they did start to build it and, and it was killed by the depression and by the fact that they could not get water, fresh water to it. It turns out that there was a bit of land in between where they, the water pipeline began and where the resort would be that was government owned and the government would not allow them to continue the pipeline. So they ended up having very little water and you can't have a very big resort without fresh water. Uh, so that, that was it. Um, the remains of it still exist there and um, off down at the bottom of the cliffs of Palos Verdes. It's just a pile of tumbled down concrete. But uh, it, and it's, it was going to be something fantastic. What was it called? Palm? It was called Royal Palms. Yeah. And, and that area, that little section of Palos Verdes, that cliff is still called Royal Palms. So you can find it. Yes? Was he friends with people like Harry Chandler and Domini? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. He knew them, he sold to them, he knew their children. He, more likely he sold to their kids because, you know, they were, they were older men, or at least uh, Doheny was. But yes, he ran in those circles. Uh, who owns the building now? And when you talk about the glass, are they putting half that glass back into the entrance area? The building is now owned by two uh, real estate developers named uh, Robert and Robin Hanasab, they're brothers, and uh, they bought it in 2007. And uh, no, it would be unbelievably expensive to try to reinstall the window or the ceiling or even make a facsimile of it. Furthermore, nobody knows exactly how it was put together and assembled. It was so complex. Five engineers from Paris had to come to assemble it. And the uh, instructions uh, no longer exist. The diagrams are gone. Yes? I guess I can't read this. Can you do a quick summary of what happened to the building since the diocese to where it is today? Very quick summary, yeah. The diocese tried to sell it as a teardown, as I said. They couldn't get buyers um, because it was in a bad section of town at that point. It didn't have central air conditioning. It had problems. And then they were selling it for $450,000, which was nothing. It included the land. This time it included the land. Um, a developer named Wayne Rakovich, who specialized in industrial properties, bought it because it was so cheap and he was going to tear it down until he went to see it. And when he walked in, he fell in love. And he said, I can't tear this down. I'm going to try to restore it. His bankers thought he was nuts. Uh, they told him that the ground floor where the store had been could only be used uh, as a uh, food court. They suggested that a Taco Bell be put in <laughs> along with others. Uh, he said, no, I want a gourmet restaurant, and he ended up finding a man named Mario Vincenti to open the best Italian restaurant in Southern California there. It was called uh, Rexi Ristorante. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and he restored a lot of it. He really he fixed it up, and he, and he made it viable again. So, that's pretty much the story from there. The penthouse, no one has lived there since James and Mary Oviet died. It has been used since 1977 to rent out for parties, and film shoots, and that's it. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so Mark, you have to tell us how this all started with your first memory of the Oviet building on your way to go swimming at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Yeah, it's a bit weird, you know, I mean, I don't know. He's like, you think of remembrance of things past, you know, how, how memories can lead you in a direction. Um, when I was a little boy, I took swimming lessons at the LA Athletic Club, and my dad and I would go out the side entrance on Olive Street, and I saw this building across the street with this, even though the front, the glass had been largely removed from the front, it still looked like it was, it was a movie palace, you know, the entrance. And I just thought, wow, this is the coolest building. But it was really run down. This was 1975, and homeless people were sleeping in that outdoor lobby at night. And in the morning, they would leave, and they'd leave all the newspapers around there, and it was a mess. Um, and then I noticed that on the side of the building, there was a name painted. It said Oviat Building on the side of the building. My, high, my principal of my elementary school was named Oviat, so I thought he owned it. <laughs> Which was impressive. It stuck in my mind. Uh, and it just sort of stayed with me over the years. I, it kept in mind, it, it, it stuck. And I would check on it sometimes to see how it was. 
noticed that it became a restaurant at some point. It was so expensive, I, I didn't even want to walk in. It was so intimidating. And then it became another restaurant, which was less intimidating, and I finally walked in. And I thought it was so beautiful. Uh, and, uh, and it finally led me to making a documentary film about it, because I found out that nobody remembered James Obia. He was almost instantly forgotten after he started going crazy with his anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, so I decided to bring it back. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Yeah, so so you're visionary of the year now. So that means you have a lot to do. You have a lot of you have a lot of work ahead of you. Oh, yeah. You're gonna give one more talk this year. I do. And you're gonna give a walking tour. I do. You're gonna figure it out. <laughs> you can tell me this be okay. Alright, everyone, thank you. I know you've run all over with us. Thank you. We'll see you next month with Joe Esterly and Linda King talking about loving and hanging Charles Bukowski. Yay! Godspeed, God bless, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.